This episode is supported by PIMCO, a global leader in active fixed income with deep expertise across public and private markets. PIMCO invests their clients' capital in income and credit opportunities that span the liquidity spectrum, leveraging their decades of experience navigating complex debt markets. Their flexible capital base and deep relationships with issuers have helped them become one of the world's largest providers of traditional and alternative investment solutions and a valued financing partner. Visit PIMCO.com to learn more. I think that the asset manager of the future is going to have to figure out how to customize very specifically. This is actually, I think, a trend that's societal. I don't think it's just limited to asset management. What has happened is the rise of the personal brand, right? That you've seen from a previous generation where it was the conventional wisdom above all else. This was the best neighborhood. This was the best car. This was the finest watch and the best bottle of wine that one could order at the most luxurious of steakhouses or whatever. These types of things stopped being true a while ago. I think now people are looking for much more individualized tastes where the collection of objects that they have purchased, of experiences that they pursue and share with others in a transparent way on social media, that becomes part of their personal brand. And in the same way, I think the investments people make are increasingly becoming part of their personal brand. I'm Ethan Devitt, and welcome to the 50 Faces podcast, a podcast committed to revealing the richness and diversity of the world of investment by focusing on its people and their stories. I'm joined today by Jay Jacob, who recently headed up Quantitative Alternatives and Multi-Asset Investment Group, which oversaw over $35 billion in assets under management. He's a member of the Board of Trustees of the National Jazz Museum in Harlem, New York, and also plays an electric guitar. Welcome, Jay. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you very much. Well, you have an extensive resume with many chapters in one place, Can you briefly walk us through your path, going right back to where you grew up, what you studied, and how you ended up in this field? Certainly. I will try to make that as unboring as possible, but I was born and raised in Montreal of Indian parents. I went to university in Cornell in upstate New York, at which point my parents moved to sunnier climes, and I felt the urge to try to become a professional musician. So I moved to New York with our drummer, who I worked with subsequently for many years, and found that being a jazz musician or a a musician of any kind in New York City is extremely difficult. I took a job to pay the rent at that time in the back office of Lazard Asset Management, which was, I think, really just done because I needed to pay the rent. I had no interest in finance at all at the time. Job consisted mostly of faxing documents and confirming numbers on the phone. Many of those functions were rapidly being automated away. This is late 90s. And I actually found the subject matter remarkably interesting and was offered an opportunity to go out onto the risk desk of the fixed income department. And I think it was difficult to hire people if they'd reached for me. It must have been very difficult indeed. And I, over time, got more and more interested in what I was actually working on and had a few opportunities to do some travel along the way. I thought the environment was such that I was given the ability to do that, which was nice. I then proposed that we look at risk in a little bit of a different way. I was doing mostly reporting at this time fairly early in in my career and thought that if we could do this for fixed income, it should be fairly straightforward to do it for other asset classes as well. And I was asked then if I were so inclined why I was not working in the technology department, which may have been in retrospect a sarcastic remark, but I said, yes, I'll do that. So I went to the IT department. I worked there for about six or seven years on developing risk systems. And then I had an amazing opportunity to use the risk systems and be part of risk management. This was in 2007. And so 2007, 2008, and 2009, I was in the risk department, newly formed. That was a fascinating time to be be in risk management, shall we say. And it probably is one that informs how I think one always creates a view about the capital markets early in one's life, right? Those formative times. And I think there's a whole generation of us who became investment adults in a very short period of time during the financial crisis. We were given the opportunity after that to start using some of those risk management techniques, practices to start a 
an investment strategy, which would include those fairly broad remit in the beginning, just saying, figure out how best to incorporate risk management into solutions. And that evolved into a multi-asset group. Around the same time, a quantitative team had joined Lazard, and we rapidly figured out that the quant team and the multi-asset team were the two teams in the organization at that particular time that were left out of the cool fundamental equity guys group. (laughs) And so we joined together informally at first and for years ended up pooling resources and formed a nice partnership. And after that, I think it was just a matter of work and luck. And we were able to grow that into a business within Lazard. Well, we'll definitely come back and ask a little more about risk management and integration. But first, what did you study if you ended up in finance through such a kind of an accidental route? Had you studied music? I actually started off in economics. I left economics after about a year and became an English major in a fairly impulsive decision involving a dispute with one of the TAs over the starting time of a class. So I decided at that point, I was going to join the welcoming arms of the English department. (laughs) They were seeing much more civilized about such things. And I loved it. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a fascinating. I didn't have the background really to do that either. I just really enjoyed it. And it was right when the internet was beginning to pick up steam. It was the early days. And a lot of the work we were doing then was to try to see how that was impacting language, how it was impacting thinking. Everything I thought then was completely wrong. But it was still, I think, again, a really interesting time to do it. I was always a hobbyist on the technology side, I suppose. It really was not, again, I didn't think of the music part. There was some studying that I did along that. Most of the music component was extracurricular. Found a group of musicians to play with, and it was quite rewarding. I'd done some of that even in lower levels of schooling, but not something that would really prepare me for New York level. So before we move into talk about multi-asset, because I do want to talk about that and its role, I always like to ask when someone has a non-conventional background, what they take from that into their professional life. So both between the music and the moving on to becoming a professional musician and the English, how did that make you think? How did it make you approach a somewhat you know, completely different environment, maybe in your own way? It's interesting what happens when you go through the generalist route. And one thing I always try to impart this as well to others that I've worked with. It came from when I was studying, actually, the, again, as I mentioned, the early days of the internet, we were looking specifically at how hate groups were using the internet at this time. And one of the things that struck me in going through, and it's a really, it's fascinating to see, it's, it's horrific in many ways what's happened since then. But even in those early days, you can see these skinhead neo-Nazi websites that were being created. And somewhere in the back of my head, I said, well, for all of the absurd and crazy beliefs that these people have, they figured out how to make a website, right? So then that kind of always inspired me to think it can't be that difficult, right? It must be possible for someone to learn this skill. And I think that's true of a lot. It's not to say that one can become an amazing developer or an amazing fund manager for that matter without any kind of background or training, but the starting point of the voyage is usually the most intimidating one. It's when you're looking at that chasm and saying, I can never learn how to do this. And I actually think that if you push yourself a few times to do some of that, it's amazing what you can do. And I think that that's a lot of the path that follows is because of that. And looking at multi-asset now, so that's something that's shape-shifting, I suppose, a little bit, is that it's looked the same, but its role has changed. For some, it was seen as the ultimate kind of mini portfolio solution, one portfolio, one-stop shop. For others, it was maybe more of an absolute return solution, some more of a risk mitigation strategy. How do you see that the role of multi-asset strategies was at the time you ended this stint working on that? How will it continue to evolve? I think multi-asset, it's almost the counterfactual to single asset. And I wonder why we ended up calling one multi-asset as opposed to calling everything else single asset. I do think that you touched on the right word, though. I think it started as a solution that will end as a solution. There were periods of time where many investors had the same problem. And so they flocked to the same solution. And this was, I would say, we'll call it the standard life era with GARS and other products like that. It was when BlackRock, Global Allocation, these became huge mega funds in the multi-asset space and executed very well on their objectives. But I think people's problems change over time. And 
the multi-asset description, I struggled with it even then, but now I think it is particularly challenging because sometimes the solution is multi-asset and sometimes it's not. The solution could well be single asset. And there are many investors today who probably say, well, anything that's diversifying away from US mega caps has really been a problem for me. And I can understand that as well, right? So I think that multi-asset, what it's held it consistent maybe to look through that is it is an attempt to stay focused on a risk objective instead of the categorization problem. And I think its name is unfortunate, but that's what our industry does. We come up with names for things and then we're stuck with them forever. But I would say the solutions part is the more important of it. That multi-asset solutions, and they're very hard to pin down, but ultimately they incorporate risk in some very important way to the point where, in fact, risk becomes part of the objective, the correct deployment of risk. Multi-asset investors tend to have a better understanding of how much risk they want to take and are happy to give up some of the control as to how that risk is taken, provided it can be optimally delivered. And risk management now, because that's where you started after a fashion, once you got through the initial position. And I suppose now that you've worked both on the risk management side, you've on the investment side, what do you think is the optimal way that risk management should be fully integrated into an investment process? So this comes to integrated into what? Because I think risk and reward play really interesting roles, usually in one's own head. The personality types, I think, are critical to proper integration of risk management. So if you consider that many investors, especially of a certain vintage, use conviction primarily to make their investment decisions. They'll gather information, they'll observe things, they might read a few tables of numbers, but ultimately they will come to the conclusion that they are right and that they will take a high conviction view. In that situation, I think risk management becomes about trying to de-bias that individual because much of the investment management complex is built around individuals. And in that situation, it is about trying to help that individual see what they might not be looking at. People develop techniques that work for periods of time in markets. When they cease to work, there can be pretty catastrophic results because they've become confident that that technique works. Risk management in that situation is all about being the annoying one to constantly ask, is this going to work again? What's happened in risk management has also evolved, though, because I think it's now expected that the measurement of risk is part of the measurement of reward. That wasn't always the case. So I think that it's not enough to just say, I've outperformed the market. It's really required that you do so at if it's outperforming a market at a similar level of risk. And that, I think, has just become more well accepted. And in many cases, risk management, when it's well integrated into the thinking in an investment decision framework, it almost ceases to exist. It's part of the portfolio management team. There's still always reporting and regulatory reporting as well as internal reporting. But I think it's about integrating it into the philosophy of the investment management team. And that, to me, really comes down to the personalities involved, especially with fundamental. But it's, it's true in quantitative, too. I love that because I speak with a lot of credit managers who worry all the time. And there's that old trope about credit managers always being the Debbie Downer of the asset allocation table because of what they're worried about and the equity guys being a little bit more optimistic and positive. I suppose what you said about risk management, I completely agree that in an ideal world, we wouldn't have a separate function. We'd all think like risk managers. By the same token, just as you said, outperforming the market, but if there's a higher level of risk is, is not the same. Equally, when someone underperforms the market, they tend to discount or do not appreciate that that might have been done with a significantly lower level of risk. I think there's a tendency to not appreciate the inherent risk in equity markets because often you don't experience that downside. I agree with that. And I would add to it and say that a good risk manager will also point out when not enough risk is being taken. Risk is about the expectation that the client has about what is being done by the steward of capital. And this is a debate that will never be ended, but I would argue that it is as bad to not have taken as much risk as the client has paid you to do as to take too much. Both can have very negative consequences to the end client, and it should be not up to the investment manager to make that decision on behalf of the client. The client has communicated a mandate to us as the manager with an understanding of a level of risk. And so the goal, I think, of any mandate is to actually meet the expectations. It's really dangerous what happens a lot of times in our industry 
is that everyone becomes obsessed with exceeding expectations. But if you keep exceeding expectations, that says more about the poor structure of the expectations than anything else. Too low, you should exactly. Be able to, you should always get what you expect. Let's look at those two errors, though, or two maybe not meeting clients' expectations. What do you think is more common? Exceeding the risk that the client expects you to take or underachieving that risk? I know what I think, but I'd love to know what you think. <laughs> I think it's probably asset class specific, actually. And it goes back to what you said about credit managers, right? I think that it's in some asset classes and in some investment approaches, there is from an early stage of investment careers, a training that goes on about how things are done. And if you compare somebody from an environment that basically has an upside-based reward, that you stand to win, you could triple your money or you could lose it all, or something like this, where there's an asymmetric benefit to taking risk, those people end up taking too much risk with their client's capital because ultimately they're the outcome from being trained to always take the highest level of risk, try to win because the cost of losing is low and the benefits of winning are high. And others, I think, take too little risk. I, I don't know. As a whole in the industry, I think there's probably a distribution that skews towards taking a bit too much risk. But again, I think the word risk itself is, is a hard one to categorize because, as I said, it's really about expectations. And falling short of expectations happens a lot. But the lowering of expectations is another game that is played in our business. Yeah, very interesting. And I suppose the last point on risk is you've watched portfolio managers come in, start as analysts, be trained, end up at the top of their game. You've seen managers bomb, I'm sure, and succeed. And I think, how much would you say about how do people learn to take risk? Are they born with it? Are good risk takers born or made, I suppose? And what do you think are some of the effective ways to teach an investor to take risk? This will sound maybe very reductive, but it, to me, is all about process. If you are able to articulate a process, then it's just a matter of following the process. It's, it's, I think, one of the most appealing things about quantitative investing is that once the process is set, there is not really the opportunity to say, oh, well, this time I'm not going to do that. When fundamental processes, for that reason, I think are much harder to stick with because sometimes the process is telling you something that doesn't maybe intuitively feel like the right thing to do. Now, the ones that are able to stick to that, I think, are probably the most legendary of investors and most don't. But I think it's process because the process can be articulated to a client. And if the client knows what you're doing on their behalf, then sticking to that process, which would incorporate risk, I think, and then seeing that, then that's generational. It passed on from one manager to the next, from the analyst who sees that risk being deployed in a way that's just transparent. That to me is how that ought to be. When it's not, that is when the process leaves too much room for improvisation. I think that can be very difficult. There's always wiggle room in every process, right? But I think you have to be able to say, this is the degree, like there are some hard points and you know we're going to operate within these lanes of risk. Fascinating. Well, let's now get into the crystal ball stage of this other discussion. <laughs> and when we look at the asset management of the manager of the future, because I think you know, having spent the time through many seats and you know, we talked about the evolving role of risk, the evolving role of multi-asset, the evolving type of solutions that we need. If you look at the asset manager's future, and the reason I ask you this is because you've always been a big user of data and an early adopter of quant strategies, and I presume experimenting with AI. What's the asset manager of the future look like and what role do all of those things play in it? I think that the asset manager of the future is going to have to figure out how to customize very specifically. This is actually, I think, a trend that's societal. I don't think it's just limited to asset management. What has happened is the rise of the personal brand, right? That you've seen from a previous generation where it was the conventional wisdom above all else. This was the best neighborhood. This was the best car. This was the finest watch and the best bottle of wine that one could order at the most luxurious of steakhouses or whatever. These types of things stopped being true a while ago. I think now people are looking for much more individualized tastes where the collection of objects that they have purchased, of experiences that they pursue and share with others in a transparent way on social media, that becomes part of their personal brand. And in the same way, I think the investments people make are increasingly becoming part of their personal brand. And you could say that that's also because of the move from defined benefit to defined contribution, where it's not just I'm receiving a pension check and wherever it comes from is how that happened. Now it's very much about, well, what have you done about it? 
that customization, I think, explains a lot of what's happening in terms of trends of sustainability or away from sustainability, even in, in different parts of the world. All of those, to me, are subsets or specific implementations of the desire to have a customized experience. And if you think of the wealth management complex, it survived in the first stages of that many years by just saying, well, medium risk, high risk, moderate risk, you know, a few basic categories. But I think in addition to risk, it's also going to be about what are the beliefs that the investment represents. That belief could be a political belief. It could be an environmental belief. It could be actually a belief about how technology is going to unfold, whatever. I mean, these are the fundaments of what investing is. It starts with a prediction about the future. How do we line up our investments with those predictions so that there is a natural sense of ownership and a reinforcing of the personal brand for every person? I think that that is the race that we're all trying to run in this industry because it's a service industry in the end. And I think that's starting to become more and more apparent. For years, it was very high margin business. And I think that kind of a high margin business is going to be reserved for really exceptional experiences. And performance, investment performance is absolutely part of that experience. And I don't mean to take away from that. But I think the rest of the experience is also there and it's been missing. And so when I think of that, I think of if you consider the overall function of the asset management business, it's get to know what the individual believes and reflect those beliefs in the investment space. And the better and more clear that is, I think the more successful that particular function will be. And so because it's very much about data, I view the asset management industry as a data processing industry. And that can be done by people, it can be done by computers, but it is ultimately that. Even the fundamental manager who's relying on gut feel is processing data and then creating an output. It's just a, a little bit more opaque as to how the conclusion is, is drawn sometimes. So getting to that, I would say it's going to be that. It's going to be customization. And to get to customization, I think, yeah, you may still have funds. You may still have pooled investment vehicles. But I think the way those are customized and assembled will start to look a lot more familiar to the end client. Fascinating. And I think there are lots of examples where the private wealth world is actually starting to influence the institutional world when it used to be the other way around. And I presume all of this, and this is really about harnessing the power of capital, power of one's own capital and one's voice and using it as a tool. I presume all of this is also dependent that there has to be a return. It's not to the point of sacrificing a return as you exercise your brand. Yeah. I mean, as with any belief, I think there are two steps to it. The first step is and if suppose I'm a client and I have belief X, two things have to happen for that to work as an experience. My belief has to come true. My prediction has to come true. But then the implementation of that has to be correct as well. So it's one thing if I say, I think that cryptocurrency will become widely adopted. And it's another for me to say, I've taken that belief and I've turned it into a very good return. Right. So there's two ways it can fall down. Cryptocurrency cannot be widely adopted, but in which case the believer in cryptocurrency has to say, well, to be fair, I did think that cryptocurrency would be widely adopted. Right. Now, where that particular client could rightfully be upset with the investment manager is, well, I've said that I wanted something that would benefit from cryptocurrency being widely adopted. That's happened, but the result isn't there. It's really interesting also because I think this is naturally why you'd put philanthropy on the same spectrum maybe as investing because often philanthropists or even just a charitable giver will give according to their identity and to the causes that are meaningful to them. And that's a giving that no return expected other than the return of being generous and the feeling that that gives you and the impact that you will feel it makes. But I think having that along a scale is, is really interesting. So I've not even thought of those two it's connected, but that's very true. Yeah, that's how we see it at Moneta. Certainly, we would see it as a spectrum of philanthropy and impact investing. And I actually would argue that the impact investing has more leverage because of the cycles it will go through. But equally, giving, sometimes there is simply a form for giving without a return expected in a financial terms. Speaking of personal brands, so this, I think, presupposes that we will be becoming more tailored to the individual client. Maybe that mirror neuron will suggest that the diversity of the industry needs to reflect the diversity of the client base. I'd love to ask you some thoughts about the diversity of the industry, given you've watched it for decades now. Do you think it's at a point where it needs to be? I mean, I think at the point it needs to be would be where, where it is actually the mirror, where it's actually reflective. So by that standard, no. 
I think improvements have been made, which is what one says. I think that it's also the case, though, that the industry chases trends. And there was a trend towards talking about diversity, which was widely adopted. Whether that turns into action, I think, is to be seen. The actual numbers were rarely being held up to account. And there's a number of different axes of diversity. I think that's another thing to consider. But ultimately, the client base will demand it. I do believe that, that the clients would like to see themselves reflected in the people that they interact with. And I think that that will be shown in their own preferences. And so I think it's who can get there first and how difficult it is. There are no end of debates as to what path it should take. There are those that are believers in quota systems and those that think that a quota system is totally inappropriate. Again, I think it's just about which prediction do you think is going to come true. I don't think it's where it should be at all. But the starting point has to be considered, I suppose. Well, going back to Jay Jacob and his personal brand, music clearly has played a large role and continues to. I'm not going to ask about that. I'm more interested in your role at the Museum of Jazz and what you bring to your role as trustee there. What excites you about the future of this institution? The Jazz Museum is something that I was always interested in, as you mentioned. I probably also, as I would have indicated by now, was not good enough to actually become a jazz musician. Very difficult thing to do. But I think that jazz is a very unique art form, especially not having grown up in the U.S., to see something that is so intertwined with the racial history and the cultural history of the U.S. in an art form that, for the most part, doesn't have words. And I, I think that that's an amazing and powerful combination, that you cannot argue with a saxophone solo. <laughs> you know, you cannot say, well, that's just a political solo. <laughs> you know, that is something that's really amazing that that art form has developed and it operates beyond the other polarizations that are everywhere in society, right? And it's amazing when you see it and the level and the degree to which they have curated talent. I mean, there's a physical space to the museum, of course, and they've got you know things like Duke Ellington's piano and such, but that I think is a small part of it. It's the music itself that they've curated, the group of people, the community that they're building with Tracy, and she's the director of the museum in Harlem. I think all of that can exist, and it's very difficult to make an effort like that exist without somehow getting into the political meanderings of what's going on. It's just such a good re reflection. It's an accurate and pure reflection of history, and I can't pretend to be anything else. That's kind yeah. of what drew me to the mission. And do you think it has a future is bright there, given the interest of the new generation in jazz? Is it something that is maybe in decline? It will depend on the definitions of jazz. That's going to be, I think, what it comes down to. If you look at it from one perspective, you could look at it as really the innovation component of what's happened in music for many years. That, I think, is where we're going to probably see, just as people are terrified the most about what the impacts of AI will be, which we could talk about investing or music. I think it will change both of them significantly. But I don't have the same pessimism on either. I think that it'll change both for the better. I think it will make them more specific. And those that are able to use more complicated tools, I mean, think about what people thought about Casio keyboards. And that, you know, 30 years ago, that was going to end everything. It kicks off a different form of innovation as people try to use new tools in different ways. So I think it, you're right. I mean, jazz is not the as popular it was as in the 50s. That's, that's for sure. But I also think that it had some resilience that probably people don't fully appreciate. And a lot of the music catalogs that are available as, as music becomes part of the almost the private equity of accumulation phase, you can see that a lot of these catalogs are being bought and sold. Those prices are not coming down. They're going up because people are using them for different purposes. On the matter, it's future. Having you as a steward, I think, is a key point. Moving now to the reflection section. So this is where I ask about setbacks and challenges and whether you learned any lessons from them throughout your career. Anything that you can speak to? I think. When we were first trying to raise capital in our first fund, I thought of all the objections. We had a, a strong argument to make and just losing time and time again, right? Not even being taken seriously. Now, of course, it makes sense, right? Well, who are, who are these people? Why should I part with any money to give to these people? I've never heard of them. I've never, right? I mean, it's just, it is a really humbling experience to go through it. 
And I think it's just, you know, a number of great mentors, I would say, and, and I've been lucky in that regard. One of them, James Donald, actually, who is the head of emerging markets, he just, if every time it was things were going well, he'd say, you're, you're being a bit too happy. And if you're very down, he would just say, you know, there's no reason to be this upset. There's patience and persistence. That's it. <laughs> That's what this whole industry is. You just basically continue on. There was a lot of those uh, setbacks. I think if you're very lucky in investing, you know, 52, 53% is a very high number of percentage of victories versus defeats, you know? So I think that there's a lot. There's many times where one feels, in, and I think this is true of many different fields and careers, that there's just this base unfairness of what's going on. That if it only could be, you could snap a finger and, and have it be resolved, that it would be better. But then, having thought of what the problem is does not mean that you're acting towards solving it. I felt like I had to learn that lesson a few times. Right? Identifying the problem does not lead to its solution alone. You have to identify it. But then there's something that happens in the mind, perhaps, where one says, having identified it, surely it's been solved. And that's not true. And then the key people, any mentors in there besides the person that suggested you move out of the back office? Anyone that either through your music career or before that influenced how you approach the world? There's the one who I think in the English department, she's passed away. Her name was Lydia Facandini. She was just this person who had such a command of the language. I was amazed. I had never heard anyone with that level. Of, and she, this was her describing a syllabus of what was to come in the year or something really mundane. She was really somebody who, she wrote a book called The Art of the Essay. It was just a, such a precise use of language. I thought that was amazing. And the strange irony is I remember, maybe it was about six or seven years ago, and I thought about how much time, because a question that's often asked in due diligence stages is, well, you know, you're an English major. What are you doing in finance? And then if you think about how many emails we have to write over the course of a day and how much we have to read and then react to what we've read, there's actually quite a lot of skill intersected there. So that's one, I would say, you know, I come from a, a fairly sizable Indian family of which there is no shortage of mentors and cousins. And that, I think, gives one a sense of you can pretty much find your way around in most of the world. It involved a lot of traveling, I guess, as a kid and then as an adult for work and otherwise. But I think that's an important skill to pick up is just to recognize that in the end, it should be everyone's aspirations that you can just wake up, be dropped anywhere on this planet and figure it out. And I think it's actually not as intimidating as it sounds, but having that network and diaspora effect, I think is helpful. And then I think investment wise, there was two, I think I named James, Andrew Lacey's the other one, also at Lazard, who I think was someone who showed the benefit of starting with yes <laughs> and ending with no when needed, which is a really optimistic way of looking at things. It's not always to be found. I love that. Last question then is words of wisdom. Any creed or motto or advice for your younger self? I think myopia is a very dangerous thing in career, in management. Thinking about one's own path in multi-year time horizons can be very dangerous because it can blind you towards opportunities that are actually emerging along the way. It happens with careers in finance all the time. People end up in a job when they're 22, and then they wake up 15 years later and they ask themselves, like, why am I a European small cap analyst? <laughs> it's just because that's where you were. So I think that's it. It's kind of keeping one's head on a swivel to be looking around. And I think that's one big one. The other one is not to take oneself too seriously. And for that, I'll credit Joanna, my wife. She's a school teacher, no interest in finance, finds it annoying for the most part, how seriously people in finance can take each other. And I think that's very important. I think that there should be a, a healthy dose of laughter on an hourly basis in one's existence. Otherwise, it's very easy to start buying into the hubris of our field, which can be very intimidating. And it's an amazing job to have, but it can also be one that takes itself a bit seriously. Well, thank you so much, Jay. This has been a fascinating discussion that has meandered into lots of wonderful philosophical <laughs> alleys. That, <laughs> no, I, 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 that's exactly the way it should be. And I think we talked about the impact of AI on music and on our industry. And it will be profound, but what gives me comfort when I think about a jazz performance is it is about the performance and the performer, not necessarily about the sound. Partly, but it's, that's maybe the bit that can be replicated. And I think so goes for investment too. It is about the performer, the performance, and about mm -hmm. tailoring as we talk. So drawing these together has been a joy. And thank you so much for coming here and sharing your insights with us. 
Uh, well, thank you. It's been really enjoyable. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice. And all views are personal and should not be attributed to the organizations and affiliations of the host or any guest. 